welcome to Grandma's Wealth Wisdom with your hospitable hosts, Brandon and Amanda Neely. This is the only podcast for strategies to grow your wealth simply and sustainably like Grandma used to. Without further ado, here are your hosts. Hey, I'm Brandon and welcome to Grandma's Wealth Wisdom, where we help you build wealth Grandma would be proud of. So today's episode is called Beggars Can't Be Choosers, and we'll be talking about the smart way to make major purchases. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but when you ask grandma for something that you don't really need, like ice cream or cookies or some kind of sweet treat, grandma might ask to see your begging license. She might ask, have you gone to the courthouse and gotten your begging license? She asked me that a couple times. Yep. (laughs) I heard this story about a little girl who would get a single strawberry candy whenever she saw her grandma. Do you remember those candies? I think they're still around. They've got like a wrapper that's red with the little green top and the seeds and then it's a hard candy with a ooey gooey goodness inside. Oh yeah. My grandma got, that was in the package, but there was like an assortment. And so she would put it in the sitting room, I guess you call it, this dish of uh, candy dish. And I would always pick out the butterscotch because I didn't really particularly like the strawberry ones. I like the butterscotch ones and we can debate over which ones are better, butterscotch or strawberry. I think butterscotch all the way. I think the strawberry ones are the best. And this little girl did too. In fact, she liked the strawberry ones so much that if grandma chose to give her a butterscotch instead for whatever reason, who knows why grandma chooses these things. But if grandma did choose that, the little girl would protest. No, I want the strawberry. No butterscotch. That's disgusting. Please give me strawberry. And then grandma would remind her that beggars can't be choosers. It was the sweet reminder pun intended, sweet mm. <laughs> yep. sweet reminder to the girl to appreciate what she was given until she could provide for herself. And of course, now as an adult, the little girl provides for herself and can get as many strawberry candies as she really likes with her own money. Or butterscotch. Like I think we should go get some of those actually after we record this. I have no idea where you even find those anymore. Oh, uh, we, we should ask grandma. <laughs> so keep this idea of beggars can't be choosers in mind today as we talk about how to go about making major purchases. Remember, beggars can't be choosers. We're talking about getting things way bigger than one piece of strawberry candy or butterscotch in some cases, and try to think through who the beggar is in the scenario that we explore. So what I want to start off with is this first point, leveraging other people's money, or as we like to say in millennial talk, OPM. Gotta love those abbreviations. Acronyms abbreviations, all that stuff. I had to explain a bunch of abbreviations to Brandon last week, like OOO and BR, best Uh, regards. Yeah, I I didn't know these. So a client was, I was like, what is OOO? Figured it out over time. Because I explained it to you. That's why you figured it out. Well, hey, use your resources. (laughs) So we're talking about OPM. Leveraging OPM, other people's money. And it sounds like a great way to build wealth. And sometimes it actually is. It it is in some cases because people have done it. There's other places that do it. But there are a few warnings grandma would give you about leveraging OPM. Yeah. So let's take college as an example. So many of us who graduated from college around 2008 or later are realizing that it's difficult to repay those student loans. We leveraged other people's money in order to get that education, to get that degree, but we aren't getting the pay that we need to repay those who lent us the money. Yeah, and that's where I'm going back to some people do it really well. Leveraging other people's money is what banks do really well. You might say banks are the foremost expert on OPM. You put your money on deposit and the bank turns around and lends it out to someone else right away. The person like two people behind you. they I don't know if it's that fast. Maybe not that fast, but it it kind of feels like that sometimes. But they are giving out that money right away. You might have heard of the idea that a run on the bank could shut it down. Like in Mary Poppins or in It's a Wonderful Life. These are true possible scenarios. Yeah, I should probably remind us of what happens in Mary Poppins, one of my favorite movies. And there is a sequel. Yeah. It's coming out in December, I think. I don't remember when it's coming out, but regardless, we're not being paid by the Mary Poppins creators to talk about Mary Poppins. It's legitimately one of my favorite movies. 
And I'm really looking forward to the sequel, although I'm sure it will not measure up to the original. Dick Van Dyke is in it, I've heard. Yeah. And I'm not sure. What was her name? The Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews. I'm not sure if she's in it. She's amazing. I love Julie Andrews. That's why I like Mary Poppins, really, is because of Julie Andrews. But anyway, in Mary Poppins, the run on the bank is instigated by Michael, the little boy, just because he wants his toppins back, which toppins are like pennies, very little money. But he starts to yell, give me my money. They want won't give me my money. And then everyone in the bank that hears him yelling this rushes to the counter to withdraw as much as they can, as fast as they can. And the bank has to close its doors because they don't have the money. Yeah. And then I think the dad lost his job, all kinds. Don't, no, no, no. Oh, wait, spoiler we're not going to, no spoiler. Sorry. Watch the movie. If you haven't seen this movie, uh, I don't know where you've been, but you should go see it. I mean, it is kind of an older movie. And if you want to do a sing along, just invite me over. Oh, that that would be fun. So this scenario is possible not just because the bank doesn't keep enough cash in its fault. It's because, by law, they are only required to keep between 3 and 10% of their deposits on the bank rolls. The other 90 to 97% is loaned out. I think this is really important because I thought this for a long time, especially like watching Mary Poppins as a kid, I figured, oh, the bank just doesn't have that money on hand. It's like they put it into some armored vehicle. It's at a a larger branch of the bank there. It's in gold bullion instead of cash. Yeah, that's really just why they had to shut down because they didn't have the cash. But that's literally not the case for banks, at least in America, where we have fractional reserve banking, if you want to Google it, that they literally only have to keep three to 10 percent of the deposit that we put in the bank at with the bank like they can loan out the rest so they literally don't even have it they've loaned it out people have spent it people have used it and they're making payments on those 90 to 97 percent depending on the size of the bank is loaned out that's like very different than probably i expected just as like a kid you know and i'm really glad i've learned that since So if everyone wanted their money at once, the bank would literally have to call their loans or borrow money from somewhere else to get everyone their money back. That's why we have the FDIC. It's to protect your money. Grandma always said, eat your vegetables. She loved making home-cooked meals with healthy food and from scratch desserts. Would you create a diet of fast food or cookie cutter financial products that made you fat and bloated with fees? Or would you like wholesome, time-honored wealth strategies served with balance and trust? Get started with your healthy money planning by downloading Wholesome Wealth Recipes. Your Moolah Cookbook is waiting for you at grandmaswealth.com. So they created the FDIC because they realized that if people needed cash, if all of us wanted our money at once, that the banks wouldn't have it because they loaned it out. And it's been spent by the people that spent it, not in the banks anymore. But what I realized when I was researching this episode was that as of December 31st, 2017, according to the FDIC's website in their annual report for 2017, the FDIC only had 1.28% of insured deposits covered in their deposit insurance fund. What does that mean? 1.28%? That's not a lot. Right. That means their deposit insurance fund, the money they've collected that is there to cover the deposits that you have in the bank, that all of us have in banks, that fund is only big enough to cover 1.28 of insured deposits. That's not even counting the deposits that are uninsured. That's crazy. Yeah. So in case you want to geek out about this like Amanda does, we'll include a link in the show notes on more about how banks work, how they actually work. Yeah. But one of our key phrases that you are going to hear us use over and over again on this podcast is this idea of don't do what the banks tell you to do, do what the banks do. Let me say that again. Don't do what the banks tell you to do. Do what the banks do. And there's a whole bunch of things we could talk about here. But in terms of the conversation today about leveraging OPM, other people's money, that means to set up a system so that you win no matter what. You take in money and then you leverage it. You loan it out. You make sure you're loaning it at a higher interest than you're paying on it and so forth. You set up the system so that you win no matter what, which leads to our next point. So what happens when you're on the borrowing side of the table at your bank? You don't get many choices when you put your money on deposit in a checking or savings account, but it seems you get even fewer choices on the terms of a loan from the same bank. So 
Who sets the interest rate? The bank. Who determines your monthly payment? The bank. What happens if you miss a payment? The bank charges you huge fees, and they might even increase your interest rate. What happens if you can't repay that loan? The bank comes and they'll take whatever you use for collateral for the loan. Maybe it's your car, maybe it's your home, whatever it is. They'll come and they'll take that. And then, if they still can't get their money back using your collateral, then they might even garnish your wages in the future. They get really serious. And I've heard they could recall it. That's only some loans. But they can recall it and say, "Hey, you owe all of it all up front." That would suck. And it's all outlined in pages and pages of legalese that you sign and initial in multiple, multiple lots of places. Yeah, a huge stack of pages and things to to read through that I don't know anyone actually reads. <laughs> So what we're getting to is you have to ask yourself a very important question. Who is really winning? Let's take an example of you take out a $20,000 loan to buy a car. Now, the $20,000 goes to the car manufacturer who built the car that you purchased. And of course, they have to use that $20,000 to cover the cost of the materials, the factory and the workers who built the car, the commission of the salesperson, a whole bunch of things. Maybe your $20,000 payment, they might make, let's say, a 10% profit on after covering all those expenses. So $2,000, maybe. I don't work in the car industry. I'm just making up these numbers. So you got the car manufacturer profiting $2,000. Maybe your local government gets some sales tax, whatever your local sales tax rates is when you buy a car. If you have one, maybe your local government gets a little bit too. But my guess is that the company that gave you the car loan, that they're going to make a great deal from that loan. So let's say you took out that $20,000 loan, you have a 7% interest rate and a five-year term on that loan. When you do the math, the financing company that gave you that loan is going to make over $4,000 in interest. That's not to mention any late fees, additional credit insurance, warranties, and so forth. That's just pure, simple interest, pure, simple profit that is going directly to the people that gave you that loan. And so if you think about it that way, and then you add on this statistic that the average American has 35% of his or her income going to servicing debt. How much did you say again? 35%. That's high. Yeah, but it's true. The average American goes to work and we get to use about two thirds of our workday to cover current expenses while the bank gets a third of our work in payments. The bank has a lot of people making them a lot of money and the majority of us aren't even on a bank's payroll and yet we're still going to work and paying the money from our salary, 35%. And that's why they're so ginormous sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about debt in episode two. The title was six of one, half dozen of the other. Even when we pay off our debts, we might find ourselves going back into debt the next time an emergency happens, when something like that strikes, or the next time we want to buy a car, we go back into debt. So go back and listen to that episode again to get a refresher on the alternatives to going into debt or just paying cash for major purchases. Yep. So to recap today, grandma's warnings might make you think twice about going into further debt, and they might be a good motivation for getting out of debt quickly. Do you really want to give a third of your income to a banker? Do you want to remain in beggar status going to banks whenever you need money for a major purchase and then having to adhere to their terms? You know, beggars can't be choosers. That's what grandma says. Yep. But what if you could leverage OPM in a way that doesn't require going into debt to a bank, a finance company, a credit card, or an investor? That would be pretty cool. Yeah, that would be awesome. To see if grandma's leverage of OPM would work for you, schedule a call with us at grandmaswealthwisdom.com slash call. We'd love to talk with you, hear what kinds of ways you want to leverage OPM to reach your financial goals, and see how we might be of service to you and your family. So today we talked about how one third of the average American income leaves their hands to go to a banker, never to be seen again, to go to a bank. Next week, we're going to talk about another place a good portion of our income ends up going. This is huge. The Internal Revenue Service. Until next time, keep building your wealth simply and sustainably for your own future and the future of our grandchildren's generation. 
The topics presented in this podcast are for general information only and not for the purposes of providing legal, accounting, or investment advice. On such matters, please consult a professional who knows your specific situation.